2 Timothy chapter 3, verses 1 through 9. Give you a moment to find it in your Bibles. And I will put it on the screen for you, I promise. For those that either cannot find it or those who do not have a Bible in front of them. 2 Timothy chapter 3, verses 1 through 9. If we're able, and you would stand today in honor of the reading of God's Word, the Word of God today reads, This know also, that in the last days, perilous times shall come. For men shall be lovers of their own selves, covetous, boasters, proud, blasphemers, disobedient to parents, unthankful, unholy, without natural affection, truce breakers, false accusers, incontinent. Now the term incontinent here means without self-control, not able to control themselves. Fierce despisers of those that are good, traitors, heedy, high-minded, lovers of pleasures more than lovers of God, having a form of godliness, but denying the power thereof. From such turn away. For of this sort are they which creep into houses and lead captive silly women laden with sins, led away with diverse lusts, ever learning and never able to come to the knowledge of the truth. Now as Janus and Jambres withstood Moses, so do these also resist the truth. Men of corrupt minds reprobate concerning the faith. But they shall proceed no further, for their folly shall be manifest unto all men, as theirs, meaning Janus and Jebus, also was. It's that time. If you'll bow your heads with me a moment. Father, once again, God, we are so grateful for the opportunity to break open the bread of heaven. We are so grateful, God, today to break open the love letter that you have given your people this guidance, this direction that you have placed on paper. Lord, today, divinely inspired and authoritatively given. And Master, in the name of Jesus, we need the anointing today. For you have placed within my heart a prophetic message. And God, I need the anointing to deliver it with the authority, the power, the love, that you would have it to be delivered. Lord, what I'm about to speak needs to find its way into the heart, not just the hearing, but into the heart of every individual under the sound of my voice. I pray, God, that your divine anointing would rest upon me. And, Lord, that it would rest as well upon every listener. Those in this place, those, God, who today are watching by reason of the Internet, let them today, O oh God, receive the Word of God with gladness, that it might bring forth joy, that it might bring forth peace, that it might bring forth faith, that it might bring forth today strength and power to endure the hours that are to come. We ask it all in the mighty name of Jesus. Amen. Praise God and amen. It's important to understand that the book of Timothy, I've told you many times when teaching from the Word of God, there are a couple of things that are extremely important that you keep in mind when you read the Bible. You cannot merely open it up and read something and, and think like, well, God just dropped these words down from heaven and they have no context. 
They have no, uh, you know, uh, there, there is nothing to consider as I read it. No, Paul is writing to Timothy. Timothy is a young man that Paul took under his wing. And he made Timothy something of a spiritual son. I'm going to tell you, young ministers, a lot of us, have found ourselves in the position over the years of coming under the ministry of an older man or woman of God, and they take us, Lisa, under their wing, and they kind of, they know we have a calling on our life, and they know that God wants to use us, and they want to help us to maximize our potential in the ministry. So they begin to teach us, and they begin to advise us, and they begin to nurture us. I had such a mentor. I've had a few such mentors. And I am grateful for every one of them. I had Brother Gillum, J.T. Gillum at the Riverside Church of God. And Brother Gillum gave me so many pearls of wisdom that I still to this day am constantly contemplating. I, though you would be amazed at how many things Brother Gillum's told me over the years uh, resound in my memory, you know, when I face certain situations and certain circumstances, Brother Gillum's words once again come to life in my spirit. If you're a young minister, if you're a young preacher, if you're someone today who claims to be called to ministry and you don't have somebody like this in your life, you have no business getting in the pulpit trying to preach. Ministry is a tough business. You need training. You need a covering. You need someone who is able, someone with experience, someone with the knowledge uh, that only time can bring to an individual. You need someone with that experience that is able to advise you and is able to help you. I've seen a lot of young preachers crash and burn. Because, Lisa, they ran out there too soon. They ran out there unqualified. They ran out there uncovered, as it were. And found that there were situations within the church that they could not handle. Timothy was Paul's spiritual son. Paul referred to him as his spiritual son. He was, in essence, uh, someone that Paul made uh, his, you know, he was a mentor to Timothy. Timothy had had a strong Jewish upbringing. He knew the scriptures, the Old Testament. He knew the scriptures. Paul is writing to Timothy as a young man of God. He is not writing to Timothy as a young Christian. Listen to what I'm telling you today. This is important. Context is important. You understand the relationship, first of all, between Paul and Timothy. Secondly, you understand Paul is not writing to Timothy merely as a believer. He is writing to Timothy uh, Martin as a future leader in the church. I've heard this passage preached my entire life. And I dare say that 90, probably 5 or better percent of the time that I've heard this preached, I have heard it preached in entirely the wrong context. To be truthful, I, you know, not because I'm so great, Martin. It, it doesn't have anything to do with that. But here is some context for you. Paul is writing to Timothy about circumstances that will come to the church in the last days. He is not writing to Timothy about situations and circumstances that will come within the world. That's important to understand. Most fundamentalist and evangelical Christians, when they read this passage, they, they do not take context into account at all, at all, 
They just ignore context. They ignore content. They ignore the fact that if you read a full portion of Scripture, it will make itself abundantly clear. This passage makes itself abundantly clear that Paul is writing about the church and not the world. It makes itself abundantly clear. You say, does it really, Pastor? Because maybe I didn't see that, or maybe as you read it, Somehow or another, I missed that. Paul said in verse number, uh, let me see here. Verse number five, he said, having a form of godliness, but denying the power thereof. Well, does that speak of the world? No. Who? even attempts to have any form of godliness. The church. Believers. He also says in verse number 7, ever learning and never able to come to the knowledge of the truth. Again, that is a, that is a passage that suggests someone within the church. But here's what cinches it. Verse number 8. Remember what I've said? Keep it in context. Don't try to pull passages out. Don't try to just pick out the passages. I read exactly to you what I read to you today because it keeps everything in context. Paul said in verse 8, Now as Janus and Jambres withstood Moses, so do these also resist the truth. Men of corrupt minds reprobate concerning the truth. Faith. Is that talking about the world? No. Paul says, I am comparing those that I'm referring to here to Janus and Jambres, who opposed Moses during the Israelites' escape and exodus from Egypt. He said, these were members of the congregation. These were part of the body that left Egypt. And yet they withstood and they stood against and they served as a stumbling block to the leader. That doesn't sound like he's comparing it to the world, does he? No. This entire passage is meant to be understood as referencing the church. So when Paul says to Timothy, this know also that in the last days perilous times shall come, for men shall be lovers of their own selves within the body of Christ, within the church. Covetous within the body of Christ, within the church. Boasters within the body of Christ, within the church. Proud within the body of Christ. Are you following me? Within the church. Blasphemers within the body of Christ, within the church. Disobedient to parents. Now you might wonder, why in the world did Paul include that in the list? Well, let me tell you something. Obedience to parents was a big issue within the context of the Old Testament law. Children being obedient to their parents was very important in the context of the Old Testament law. A child who's not obedient to their parents is one that generally is self-willed, that is stubborn, that is uh, rebellious. These are not positive traits. My parents growing up, you know, my father was hell on wheels to live with, but you know what? I still obeyed him. Didn't matter what kind of hell on wheels he was. I didn't run around Martin not doing what my father told me to do. No, if he told me to do something, I did it. Do you hear what I'm telling you now? Why? Because within the context of a parent-child relationship, a child's supposed to do what their parents tell them to do. Period. End of the story. Case closed. After all, Mom told you only a thousand times as you were growing up, when, and you'd ask her the question, Why should I do it that way? Why should I do this? What was her answer? Because I said so. 
<laughs> That's all the answer you need. Am I telling the truth? Because I said so. Hey. That's the nature of this relationship between a kid and an adult. That's the nature of the relationship between a parent and an adult. If I say to do it, bless God, you do it. You can begrudge it. You can hate it. You can be mad about it all you want to be. You can cuss me under your breath. I guess I'm the only one that ever did that. As you're doing it, but bless God, you're going to do it. Now, the only one I know who was disobedient to parents to a, to a fault was Booby. His mom would say, you're going to eat them peas, child, or you ain't getting up from this table. He'd outweigh her. Bless God, he made up his mind. See, that's one of the joys of being an only child, see. And, and having a mother and a dad who, bless their heart, their doctrine may be wrong, but they, they was at least trying to be decent parents, you know. My mother would have beat me to a crisp if I had to try to outweigh her. But him, he'd sit there, and I mean, you know, the, the moon would start to rise, and the peas were glistening in the moonlight, and he's sitting there. Mom's like, you haven't eaten them yet? Well, you ain't getting up on that table, do you eat those peas? Mm-hmm. We'll see about that. <laughs> and Martin, there we'd come, midnight hour, dark as can be. Mom come in the kitchen, flip on the light, there was Tommy. <laughs> yeah, mm -hmm. them peas are still on the plate. You know what? Ain't a one of them disappeared. Not a one of them. You're going to sit there till those peas are eating them. Turn off the light and leave the room. Mom comes in, you know, with her hair up and curlers and a robe on and her little, her little flip-flops in the morning to make her husband breakfast before he goes to work. And there sits Tommy. <laughs> <laughs> but those peas are still on the plate. That's the kind of disobedience I'm talking about. <laughs> Trying to make light a little bit today. But no, obedience to parents. Paul's talking about this. You've got to remember, again, this place to context. Paul is writing to Timothy, who is a young man. Timothy is... His parents are very faithful believers, and they're people who know the Scriptures. They, too, were very well established in the Jewish faith. They, too, had come to Christ. So Paul mentioning disobedient to parents, he's saying, in the last days, you know how you grew up being taught to do as you're told by your mom and dad? Well, I got news for you. In the last days, even in the church, kids are not going to be doing what they're told. They're not going to submit themselves to their parents well, I'm going to tell you why. <laughs> I'm going to tell you why. Because kids learn what they see. I don't know how many times someone has said to me, Bless God, I've got a dad who claims to be so religious and claims to be so spiritual, and he goes to church every Sunday, but he sure is picky about which parts of the Bible he wants to follow. You ever heard somebody say that? You ever heard somebody say, oh yeah, I've got a grandma, she's so religious and she's so spiritual, but boy, I'll tell you what, uh, she still does this and she still does that. I've heard her preacher preach against lying. I've heard her preacher preach against this and that. And yet I've seen my grandma still do it. Kids learn what they see. I got news for you. If you can't be obedient to your heavenly father, they're going to feel no need to be obedient to their earthly father. Hello now. One of the reasons you're going to see kids in the last days disobedient to their parents is because their parents have lived a lifestyle of disobedience to God. Oh my goodness. Unthankful unholy, without natural affection. Mothers who don't act like mothers, fathers who don't act like fathers. There is a certain natural inclination that comes with being a father, that comes with being a mother. I know because my father didn't have it. 
My father didn't have, there was nothing in him cared about being a father. My father could have cared less about being a father. Most fathers are proud of, I, you know, Tommy and I talk about it all the time. Go out to Walmart, go out to a restaurant, and just look at all the little Hispanic kids that come into the restaurant, you know, and look at all them little boys and tell me they don't have the nicest haircuts and they aren't all kept clean and kept nice. Am I telling the truth? Man, them little Hispanic kids, I mean to tell you, their father and mother must take them to the barber every other day. Those kids always look like they've had a fresh haircut, like they just got a haircut. I don't know what it is. Have you ever noticed that? Seriously, you ever noticed that? You ever notice their little girls look so pretty? They're always in these little fluffy dresses. They're always in these pretty little dresses. You know, those folks, their parents take real pride in their children. They really look at their children as being a reflection of themselves. Do you follow what I'm telling you? When I was a kid, my father didn't care about putting money out for haircuts. My brother Michael and I ran around most of the time looking like an old dried up mop. Our hair was long, and I mean, uh, it, was, it wasn't like we were wearing it that way on purpose. No, it was just uncontrolled. It was long. We just didn't have money for haircuts because my father didn't care about it keeping his kids looking nice. You follow what I'm telling you now? But there are natural, there are things that are just uh, bred in a woman concerning her children. There are things that are bred in a man concerning his sons and concerning his daughters. And yet in the last days, the Word of God said, within the church, they'd be without natural affection. Now, what cracks me up is I've heard the church try to preach over the years. This has to do with those queers. This has to do with those homos because their affections are not natural. Well, that's funny because that ain't the way the Jewish faith sees it. That's not the way the Jewish faith understands it. They believe it's as natural as anything else. They don't see homosexuality as being the least bit unnatural. No, it doesn't have anything to do with being unnatural. But they believe they want to they want to apply that definition. You know why? Because that way they can avoid what it really means and what it's really talking to. You got parents. Their child comes home and says, Mom, Dad, I'm gay. And what do they do? They throw their kid out on the street and they ignore them. They have nothing to do with them as though they had never played part in bringing that child into this world. I got news for you today. That is without natural affection that ain't the way that nature would have a mother treat their child that is not the way nature would have a father treat its child and God teaches fathers love your children you are a representative to them of God if you teach them that love is conditional they will forever believe that God's love is conditional. How many of us for many years believed that God's love is conditional? How many of us had parents that loved us when we were doing everything just right and just perfect, but by golly, don't do anything the way you ain't supposed to do it because all of a sudden their love was on the shelf. Hello now. And we were made to believe that love is conditional. And I tell the truth today. Oh, children, I'm going to tell you, when the people in the church mess up, we have problems. Continuing, remembering, we're talking about the church. Unthankful, unholy, without natural affection, truce breakers. Meaning, they come to an agreement in order to maintain peace. But then they turn around and they break that agreement. False accusers, incontinent, unable to control themselves, fierce, forever and always angry, always in a 
state of mind. Oh, I'm telling you, I grew up in the fundamentalist camp, and I'm going to tell you, honey, most fundamentalists are in a constant, Johnny and I tell the truth, they're in a constant state of anger. They're in a constant state of, of oh, I'm mad at this. I'm mad, at, I'm mad at the world. I'm mad at the government. I'm mad at this one. I'm mad at that one. Oh, I mean the enemy. Everybody they see as the enemy, they're mad. At. I've got an aunt, bless her heart, she's so holy, she won't even sit in the same room as me. That woman is the most hateful, nasty, malicious, mean-spirited woman. I don't mean just because of the way she treats me. No, 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 no. You ask anybody that knows her. Oh, but she thinks herself one of the highest saints in the church. I got news for you, honey. The way you're acting is not the way any saint in the church ought to be acting. Follow peace with all men and holiness, without which no man shall see God. You're supposed to follow peace with everybody, not be at war with everybody. My Lord, have mercy, and I tell the truth today. Incontinent, fierce, despisers of them that are good. You let somebody live this thing the way it's meant to be lived, and my aunt will just hate that person because they don't hate the same people she hates. They're not mad at the same people she's mad at. Do you know what I'm talking about? Oh, I just can't stand that person. Boy, I tell you, oh, they just love anybody. Oh, they got a gay son, and they just let their gay son come into their house. And, oh, I mean, oh, and they just, my God. They hate that person. You know why they hate them? They hate the goodness in that person because they are so far away from being what they ought to be. And when they seek good in somebody else, it just ticks them off. Am I the only one in the room that knows anybody like this? Anybody else know what I'm talking about? Seriously? Oh, yeah. I'm telling you, I know people like this. They hate people who don't hate like they hate. They hate people who aren't angry at the same people they're angry at. They hate people who have a different view than their view on any given issue. Man, if you don't look at homosexuality the way I look at homosexuality, I don't care if you call yourself a Christian or not. What? Really? My God have mercy, what a sickening place the church has come to. Said traitors, heedy, high-minded, lovers of pleasures more than lovers of God, having a form of godliness, but denying the power thereof. Listen to Paul's advice. From such turn away. Said avoid these people. You know why I ain't in the fundamentalist movement anymore? You know why I took the word evangelical off our website, even though technically we're an evangelical church? Because those people have so identified themselves as being on the devil's payroll that I don't even want by accident to be identified with them. From such turn away. I don't want to be in the company of people like that. I don't want to have nothing to do with that. I took an entire uh, Facebook profile off of Facebook because I was connected to all my old friends and people I knew from way back when. Uh, you know, and every one of them fundamentalists, every one of them uh, evangelical. And the minute, the minute Donald Trump won the election, literally, folks, I went online. I said, all right, people, I'm shutting down this site. I'm shutting down this profile. Because I knew the crap and the garbage and the filth I was going to be seeing and reading from that day forward from those people. And I didn't want to know nothing about it. I literally, Martin, just deleted the entire thing. I was connected to like 400 people on that. It wasn't like I was just connected to, you know, a handful of people. But, oh, uh, no, I don't want nothing. I don't want nothing to do with you people. You've done revealed your colors. You have shown me that what Paul warned Timothy about in, first, uh, in 2 Timothy 3, you have shown me that you are those people. I just described Donald Trump to a T. Exactly. Hello now. You read that list and tell me you don't see Donald Trump in that list. I just read that list. Tell me you don't see Franklin Graham in that list. Tell me you don't see Kenneth Copeland in that list. Tell me you don't see Pat Robertson in that list. Hello now. 
Oh, all these people are filthy rich. All these people have all kinds of money. All these people are more interested in what this world has to offer than what God's offering. All these people are making merchandise of God's people. All these people are making merchandise of the gospel in order to live luxurious lives. All of these people are quick to falsely accuse. Hello now. All of these people are quick to stir up anger and malice and negativity. Lisa, nowhere in my Bible, nowhere in my Bible do I read where a child of God is given permission to do that. Nowhere. No, my Bible said, blessed are the peacemakers. For they shall inherit the earth. You see, my Bible teaches me that God wants his people to be people who pursue peace at all times, at all costs. We're not meant to be argumentative. We're not meant to be combative. We're not meant to be negative. We're not meant to be accusatory. We're not meant to be judgmental. We're not meant to be critical. We're not meant to... Be living these lives that cause other people to want to walk to the other side of the street when we come down the road. No, if we're living this thing right, like Sister Davis, bless her heart, from, from Athens, Texas. Holiness, high hair, long sleeves, UPC preacher's wife. And I'm going to tell you, a lot of UPC folks have a very bad reputation. You go to a lot of towns, I'm not kidding, you go to a lot of towns... And you mention the UPC in that town, and you're going to get a lot of nasty looks from people. You're going to hear a lot of nasty comments. You know why? Because those people are so holy, and they think so highly of themselves, heavy, high-minded, that they won't hardly even look at somebody that doesn't wear their hair like they do, that doesn't wear dresses like they do, that doesn't follow the same rules they do, that doesn't attend the same church they attend. Hello now. That's the organization Sister Davis belonged to. But you know something about Sister Davis? Sister Davis didn't care about how everybody else was living their Christian life. She was going to live it the way the Bible teaches to live it. And I knew people who weren't UPC. I knew a, I know a girl who married one of the young men from that church. She grew up Baptist. She wears her little skin tight, skimpy little jeans and her little tops and all that. And she said every time I saw Sister Davis at the Walmart or every time I saw Sister Davis at the grocery store. She said, you know what that lady would do? Well, I'll tell you what a lot of UPC preachers' wives would do. They'd be like that. As if they never saw you. Clearly they saw you, but they just turned their head and go the other way. She said, you know what Sister Dave said? She'd open her arms and she'd grab hold of me and give me the biggest hug and rock me and say, well, hello, baby, how are you? She showed love. Oh my God, if the church would only act the way the church is meant to act. Can you imagine the impact we'd have on our world? We got a whole church full of people today who supported Donald Trump and his rise to power because birds of a feather flock together. Don't give me this crap. Oh, we know he's wicked. We know he's evil. But we believe God wants him in there anyway because he's going to do the right things. Uh, hey, stupid. I got news for you. I got big news for you. What you think is him doing the right thing, he's doing it all right, but he's not doing it for the right reasons. He's got an entirely different agenda. And the whole time you bunch of morons are supporting him, you are helping him to take over this country and throw our Constitution out the door so that we can be a dictatorship. People who think, uh, Martin, that that's a far-fetched claim, right? Let me tell you a little secret. Study history. Do you know what the average lifespan of a democracy is? 200 years. Do you know what generally has happened historically to the average democracy? It ends in oligarchy and dictatorship. That's history. I got news for you, folks. What's happening now is not anything that hasn't happened many, many times before. You know the old saying, the only thing we learn from history is that we don't learn a stinking thing from history? Well, that's the truth. 
if people learned anything from history, if the average American, if the average person had a brain in their head and would actually use it to think instead of allowing themselves to be manipulated. I'm going to tell you, the Republican Party has been dividing this country for the last 40 years. This is nothing new. Donald Trump is not something new. No, 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 not by a long stretch. All he is is a blown-up, exaggerated version of what the Republicans have been for the last 30 years. That's all he is. He's an in-your-face. They've been trying, they've been doing it a little bit less in your face, a little bit less obviously, but they've been pulling the same crap. Fox News and all this garbage. It kills me. Oh, the God Almighty. Fox News supports every stinking conspiracy that comes down the pike as long as it's against a Democrat. You don't hear them supporting a single thing that's ever said toward a Republican. You don't hear one single thing. Now, there was a woman just got killed the other day who was connected to that whole Trump Tower meeting thing. You know, she's supposed to be like a go-between between somebody and somebody, and she got killed. Now, if that had been Hillary Clinton and somebody, she had had it. Oh, my goodness, that would have been part of the many dozens of people that the Clintons had murdered, am I telling the truth? Do you hear anybody getting up and saying, hey, look at this, Trump's killing these people off, so they can't testify against him, and they cannot provide evidence of collusion between him and the... You don't hear anybody saying that. But you know what? They, they're right. We just watched Kavanaugh get up in front of the Senate and accuse the Democratic Party of purposely going after him, and this is a conspiracy, and they're doing it uh, in effort to get revenge for Hillary Clinton for losing the election. Where's the evidence for one word he spoke? Is there any evidence for one? No, of course not. Is there one word, is there one ounce of evidence for half the garbage that comes out of Donald Trump's mouth? No, there's not an ounce of evidence. He says things, he makes accusations all the time that have absolutely no evidence to support them. I really won the popular election. But the numbers were jiggled with by, you know, these conspiracists on the... Where's the evidence of that? There is none. He even appointed a group to try to prove his point. What did they want if they wanted to disband him without any proof being offered? Because there was no proof of that. That issue just kind of silently faded in, oh, into the darkness. Folks, false accusers. Hello now. False accusers. hard for me to get in the vein today because this whole thing just has my spirit so troubled. When someone commits a capital crime and they're sentenced to death, a lot of times they go through appeals processes, a lot of times they have people who are fighting for them and fighting for their lives and right up until the moment of their being taken out of their cell and walked down that dark hallway to the electric chair, to the table where they're going to be drugged and killed, right up till the moment they may hold out some hope that the governor is going to pardon them or someone's going to intervene, something's going to happen. But when all options have been pursued and no action has been taken eventually the warden and a minister a priest a pastor are going to walk into that cell and they're going to say it's that time it's that time what time is it well you knew it was coming you knew it was coming. Hello now. But it's that time. It's not coming anymore. It's here. It's not coming anymore. 
it's here. I've got a word from the Holy Ghost for the church today. Everything we read in our primary text, uh, 2 Timothy 3, 1 through 9, everything we read, it is no longer something we are to look forward to in the future. It's here. It has arrived. It's that time. We are living in that hour. Do you hear what I'm telling you now, folks? We've been reading this passage for decades, and we've been saying, oh, this is coming, this is coming, this is coming, this is coming. I've got news for you, honey. All the holes, all the appeals, everything that could be done to try to put it off has failed, and now the, the uh, uh, warden stands before us and informs us, it's that time. We are now living in the hour that Paul prophesied in 2 Timothy 3. Do you hear what I'm telling you now? And that does not speak. It's so imperative that you understand today that all these wicked, evil, negative, nasty traits are not descriptive of what's going to happen in the world, but rather what is going to happen in the church. It's imperative that you understand that today, folks. Because if you don't understand that, then you're not going to understand that we're in that time right now. Let me tell you, further down in the same chapter, verse 19, the Apostle Paul said, But evil men and seducers shall wax worse and worse, deceiving and being deceived. See, that's the interesting thing about people who are liars and people who are deceptive. Almost without fail, they'll be the first one to, <laughs> to fall victim to a lie or to fall victim to a deception. My father, I, I hate to use him as an example, but I, I grew up with this. I saw my father makes Donald Trump look like Gabriel, the angel, okay? Uh, he really does. My, I, when I watch Donald Trump, I see my father. I literally do because my father was every bit as much a narcissist and a lunatic as Trump is. My father could lie to you straight to your face and just make it look so real you wouldn't believe. He threatened my life while I was pastoring my first church and my parents were going through a divorce. Showed up at my grandparents' house, was calling me out to the road. God only knows if he had a gun or what, because the man was crazier than a loon. My aunt was scared out of her mind, my Aunt Leslie. She called the police. The police came. All of a sudden, Martin, you wouldn't believe. You would not believe the act my, put, my father put on with that cop. I just came to see my son. I just came to visit my son. All of a sudden, one minute ago, he was raving and screaming and hollering. All of a sudden, uh, Johnny, he was just as calm and just. And the police officer said, really? Do you often visit with him in the middle of the street? <laughs> police officer came into the house after a while because they had two different cops. You know, one talked to him, one talked to me. The other police officer came in the house a little while later, and he said to me, he said, son, don't worry about this, he said. I've been a cop for a long time. He said, I see right through this crap. He said, this guy ain't fooling me. I see right through it. He said, don't you worry. You see, I'm going to tell you something. When Donald Trump was running for president, I saw right through him because I lived with him for the whole growing up part of my life. I saw people who could lie with impunity. I saw a man who could lie straight to my mother's face. Stand there and tell him he was doing work for a woman. Tell, the, tell my mother the woman's name. Oh, I'm working for Virginia. It's this woman I know from work, and I'm helping her do stuff around her house. And my father stand there, he'd give this big old story. And then for months, he'd be going to her house almost every night. He was working for her, all right. See, I've seen all that garbage. I've seen people who accuse the other person. My father constantly accusing my mother of stuff that he himself was doing. Deflecting the attention by constantly accusing. I've got news for you. That was another one of Hitler's little tricks. His chief propagandist said, 
accuse the other side of doing that which you are doing yourself. Donald Trump says, oh, I just read this maybe a day or two ago. Oh, the Democratic Party is the most corrupt, most law-breaking party. They're the most law-breaking, corrupt people that have ever been in the United States of America. Accuse the other side of doing what you yourself are doing. I watched my father pull that crap. I watched my father, every day of his life, my father tried to divide his children from his wife. He didn't want, my father wanted no allies in our home. He did not want the children allied with mom because then if the children ever say anything about something dad's doing or something they saw, mom might believe him, might believe us. So my father proactively was constantly trying to divide. He was constantly trying to make one side angry at the other side. My, I've seen all this garbage before, people. Trust me, I've, I've lived it. I have seen it in my own home. If you never lived it, you don't know what turmoil feels like. I know what turmoil feels like, and I'm going to tell you a little secret. I am feeling the exact same demon spirit today that I felt growing up as a kid. The exact same spirit that I felt in my home, I am now feeling at a national level. Somebody who constantly is deriding the press as being the false press. Why? The fake news. Why? Because he's doing everything in his power that when they report something, you won't believe it. And guess what? Several years ago, and it's on, it's recorded. I've heard the recording. He told a news reporter one time, yeah, I do that on purpose. He told her! He said, I accuse the, the press of being fake and fraudulent because that way when they write something negative about me, people won't believe it. Now that isn't necessarily true. Maybe some people won't believe it because they're dim-witted airheads, but a lot of people are going to know better, and they're going to know that when these people have done their research, and when these people have provided all this documentation, like the New York Times recently did, that chances are you can believe their story. Hello now. But I'm here to tell you, it's that time. We've reached the hour, folks. There is no more looking forward and expecting that day to come. Listen, I'm trying to close. I know I've gone long today. I don't know how long because I forgot to look at the clock when I started. <laughs> Let me help you keep this in context today. In Matthew 24, verses 3 through 13, Jesus, the Lord himself said, And as he sat upon the, upon the Mount of Olives, the disciples came unto him privately, saying, Tell us, when shall these things be, and what shall be the sign of thy coming and the end of the world? And Jesus answered and said unto them, Take heed that no man deceive you. Notice the emphasis is on deception. In other words, it's not going to be a matter of, Lisa, these things are going to be so obvious. You know, these things are going to be in your face obvious. No, 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 no. There's going to be a deception at work. There's going to be a spirit of deception. Jesus said, take heed that ye be not deceived. Remember what Paul said in 2 Timothy 3, verse 19? But evil men and seducers shall wax worse and worse, deceiving and being deceived. So what you got to look out for is deception. Jesus said, Take heed that no man deceive you. For many shall come in my name, saying, I am Christ, and shall deceive many. And ye shall hear of wars and rumors of wars. See that ye be not troubled. Now listen to this next phrase. For all these things must come to pass. Remember what I said a little while ago about what's happening in America today has to happen, so don't expect God to change it just for you and me. No, it has to happen. It has to happen. He said these things must come to pass, but the end is not. For nation shall rise against nation and kingdom against kingdom, and there shall be famines and pestilences 
and earthquakes in diverse places. You remember what I told you? For the, for the stage to be set for the Antichrist, there has to be absolute chaos. Remember what I told you? That's that, that is what the Antichrist is going to step into. He is going to step into a scene of international, worldwide chaos. So the United States cannot be the only country that everything's working fine and everything's going the way it's supposed to go and everything else, and everybody else is again. No, 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 no. It has to be worldwide chaos. Now listen. Then shall they deliver you up to be afflicted and shall kill you and ye shall be hated of all nations for my name's sake of all nations of all nations i got news for you evangelical fundamentalist christians if you think you're being a christian in america it's gonna prevent you from experiencing this tribulation and experiencing this uh, persecution, <laughs> I guess again. That's not Pastor Charles' opinion. That's what Jesus said. He said you should be hated of all nations. Not most nations, not many nations. Of all nations. Let me tell you a little secret, folk. This whole mess that's happening right now, it's going to turn on the church before too long. <laughs> once Trump gets exactly what he wants, once Trump gets where he wants to go, oh, then he no longer needs these people. And we've already seen how Donald Trump treats people that he no longer needs. Hello now. Oh, he's a great guy. He's going to be a great asset to our campaign. Oh, I'll tell you what, he's wonderful. He's terrific. Oh, him? Oh, he, he never did anything for our campaign. He, I barely even knew him. I, I, he wasn't even involved in nothing. Hello, now am I telling the truth? This guy will throw anybody under the bus. He could care less. Oh, he's a great attorney. Let me tell you, oh, Cohen's a great guy. He's been my attorney for years and years and years. And Oh, yeah, he's terrific. I love him. He's great. What's that you say? He's in court. He's decided to cooperate. But, oh, oh, he never did nothing for me anyway. He just did the little things. I mean, I only use him for little minor things. And all these air-handed dingbats on the right side of the aisle believe every word this man says. They're not even seeing, Martin, that he goes from high to low in a matter of two minutes. They don't even care that he can say one thing this minute and turn around the next minute and say the exact opposite. They're not paying attention worth a hang. They could care less. Deceived and being deceived. Do you hear what I'm telling you now? And then shall many be offended and shall betray one another and shall hate one another. When have we seen an hour of greater division and hatred and malice than we're seeing today? And many false prophets shall rise and shall deceive many. I love when somebody sends me an email. You're a false prophet. I said, really? <laughs> then the devil sure is working a stupid plan. <laughs> Because I'm sure not reaching a whole lot of people. <laughs> if I'm a false prophet, then the devil sure is, he sure is one stupid warrior. I'll tell you what, for a general, the Bible said we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities and powers, against the rulers of the darkness of this world, against spiritual wickedness in high places. The devil, I'm telling you, the, the we know the spirit world is highly organized and it functions like a, like a time clock, Johnny. Oh, but the devil's using me to deceive you all. Woo! That don't make any sense. No, I'm going to tell you a little secret, folks. The devil don't use little people like me. He uses the big guy that has following of millions. If I can deceive that one, if I can deceive Franklin Graham, I can bring down millions. If I can deceive Pat Robertson, I can bring down millions. If I can deceive Kenneth Copeland, I can bring down millions. 
That's how the devil operates, honey. The Bible said in the last days, they'll heap unto themselves teachers having itching ears. I got news for you, honey. I don't have a church full of people with itching ears. I almost wish I did. <laughs> So if the devil's using me as the false prophet, he's a pretty stupid devil. No, it's not how he works. It's not how he works. We've got Christians today believe if you're on television, somehow or another, you're God-ordained and God-blessed. And, oh, man, the only way you can be on TV is if God puts you there. Hallelujah. Glory to God. And so every word that comes out of these TV preachers' mouths, they believe. And they have caused celebrity to become in their mind, elevation in the body of Christ. They've caused the, oh, if a preacher can become a celebrity, then that means that God has exalted them, and their voice is more powerful, and what they have to say is more true than that little preacher at a little independent church down there in the corner. I got news for you, honey. That little preacher down in the little corner of the woods somewhere is probably the only one telling the truth. Many are called. But few are chosen. You're either going to believe the Bible or you're not going to believe the Bible. So while you think God's using a little nitwit like me as a false prophet to deceive people, oh, glory to God, oh, yeah, I'm leading. I can't even say dozens to hell. Good grief. I'm going to tell you something. I, I exposed Kenneth Copeland for what he was. I exposed the doctrine he was preaching as being a doctrine of demons. I'm talking 35 years ago when I was pastoring my first church. I told the church then, I said, let me tell you something. This prosperity gospel, see, I was there when the prosperity gospel first was given birth to, okay? And I warned the church. I said, this is a false message. This is designed to get Christians into a carnal way of thinking, into a carnal thought process, into a worldly thought process where they are focused more on natural things than they are on spiritual things. I said this is going to be the destruction of the church. Oh, but they heaped unto themselves teachers, Martin, having itching ears. Oh, Kenneth Copeland claims to be a billionaire. Claims to be a billionaire. I'll tell you who the false prophets are. The only problem is I've been telling you for 35 years who the false prophets were. I told you Benny Hinn was a false prophet. Now we got Benny Hinn who made the claim that Jesus was going to physically appear at one of his meetings. This is what Benny Hinn has said. Did you not hear what the Lord just said in the passage I just read to you? Well, maybe you need to hear another part, and then I'm going to close, I promise. I'm trying to, trying to wrap it up. Here's my final passage for today. Oh, let me finish that first. Then shall they deliver you up to be afflicted, and shall kill you, and ye shall be hated of all nations for my name's sake. And then shall many be offended, and shall betray one another, and shall hate one another. And many false prophets shall arise, and shall deceive many. So the false prophets are not deceiving a few, Lisa. They're deceiving many. And I got news for you. If you took every affirming apostolic preacher in all of America, we wouldn't fill up one single average apostolic church between all our churches, okay? We're not deceiving many. And because iniquity shall abound, the love of many shall wax cold. But he that shall endure unto the end, the same shall be saved. Now listen to my final passage, Matthew 24, same chapter. We're going down a few verses. It's a long, long, long chapter. I didn't want to read the whole chapter. But I did keep each section in context. Verses 21 through 31. For then shall be great tribulation such as was not since the beginning of the world to this time. No, nor ever shall be. And except those days should be shortened, there should be no flesh be saved. 
This is how bad it's going to get. People keep saying, Donald Trump's got his finger on the nuclear button, and dear God Almighty, we could wind up in a nuclear war at, the, at a moment's notice because this man is unhinged. And, you know, uh, well, I got news for you, folks. The Bible said, unless the days be shortened, no flesh would be saved. So in other words, God says, all right, I'm going to call this thing to a close. We're going to have the rapture. We're going to call this thing to a close. <laughs> because if I don't, they will literally destroy the entire planet. They will destroy every living thing on this planet. He said, except for the elect's sake, those days shall be shortened. Then if any man shall say unto you, listen, lo, here is Christ, or there." Believe it not. For there shall arise false Christs and false prophets and shall so, uh, show great signs and wonders. Insomuch that if it were possible, they should deceive the very elect. Now you say, well, who are the elect? Is he referring to the Jewish people? Is he referring to the church? He's, to, he's referring to the cream of the crop in the church. And I'm going to prove it to you in a minute. But listen to what the Lord said in verse 25. Behold, I have told you before. He said, I'm giving you advance warning. You, the, you're not going into this thing without knowing it's coming. All right? I'm declaring to you today, it's that time. Why? The Lord already told us. He, he warned us ahead of time, all right? I'm trying to let you know. That's where we're at, folks. Don't keep looking at this as being something that's far off in the future. No, no, no. It's not far off in the future. It is now. We are at that hour. For there shall arise false Christs and false prophets and shall show great signs and wonders, insomuch that if it were possible, they would deceive the very elect. Behold, I have told you before. Wherefore, if they shall say unto you, Behold, he is in the desert. Who? Jesus. Go not forth. Behold, he is in the secret chambers. Believe it not. For as the lightning cometh out of the east and shineth even unto the west, so shall also the coming of the Son of Man be. It's going to be that fast. Bible said in a moment, in the twinkling of an eye, we shall be changed. Hallelujah, glory to God. For wherever the carcass is, there will the eagles be gathered together. In other words, the signs are going to make it obvious what's going on. When you see a bunch of buzzards flying around, you know something's dead somewhere. That's what the Lord's saying. He said, when you see a bunch of eagles flying around, you know something's dead somewhere. All right? So the signs are going to be there. It's going to be obvious. Immediately, he said in verse 29, after the tribulation of those days shall the sun be darkened and the moon shall not give her light and the stars shall fall from heaven and the powers of the heavens shall be shaken. And then shall appear the sign of the Son of Man in heaven. Hallelujah! And then shall all the tribes of the earth mourn and they shall see the, the Son of Man coming in the clouds of heaven with power and great glory. And he shall send his angels with a great sound of a trumpet. And they shall gather together, listen, his elect from the four winds, from one end of heaven to the other. So who's the elect? The church. God's people. Whew. What am I trying to do? If this hadn't sounded like a real uplifting, positive message, it is. Because look what's coming. And if God said what we're going through now was coming and we realized uh -huh, it's come, you know where I'm going. <laughs> If he said all hell was going to bust loose, and all hell was busted loose, I got news for you. 
He also said, I'm coming back. I'm going to get you. Don't be afraid. Don't worry. Just persevere. Just keep pressing on. I will return. Hallelujah to God. And if he said this was coming and it's come, then you can know that when he said he's coming, he's coming. Hallelujah. So we can look forward to the positive in spite of the negative. And God, he said, I've told you. I've told you beforehand. Hallelujah. He gave us forewarning, folks. So there's nothing to be fearful of. There's nothing to be afraid of. But you've got to think smart. You've got to keep your head on straight. You've got to walk with discernment. And you've got to be ready to do whatever needs to be done in response to this situation. The Word of God said this would come. It's that easy. He also said He'll come. Well, this has come, and he will come. Would you stand with me this afternoon?